Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm delighted to welcome a man who's been the face and voice of intelligent, credible, and insightful journalism and broadcasting in Canada for over 30 years. From his iconic platform at the TVO Network in Toronto, he's hosted numerous highly popular political and current affairs series, including Between the Lines, Fourth Reading, Studio Two, and Diplomatic Immunity. Since 2006, he's been hosting TVO's immensely successful flagship current affairs program, The Agenda with Steve Pakin, which engages, informs, and educates viewers on a broad range of public policy issues. The Agenda is considered must-see TV by millions of viewers. He's also produced several highly acclaimed documentaries, including the monumentally important Return to the Warsaw Ghetto, for which he won numerous awards at international film festivals. And if that weren't enough, he's a prodigious writer of seven books and hundreds of articles. In 2013, he was made an officer of the Order of Canada and invested into the Order of Ontario. He's the brilliant and prolifically gifted national treasure, Steve Pakin. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I will never live up to that. Not a chance. <laughs> now, Steve, I think it's only fair that I tell our viewers that I've known you all your life because we're both from Hamilton and our parents were very good friends. And my claim to fame is that I got to be your babysitter. That is true. You were my babysitter once upon a time. So I've probably known you, Harvey, for, oh gosh, more than 50 years. I knew there was something special about you when at the age of 10, I suggested to you that we watch I Love Lucy reruns and you wanted to discuss the Magna Carta. <laughs> now you'll forgive me if I don't remember every single detail of that conversation. Is that true? Yes. Oh yes, that's true. I said, I want to go to law school. And you said, oh, that's really good because I've been reading the Magna Carta. You were 10. Yeah, I'm not sure I was actually reading the Magna Carta, but I do remember studying it at school. So that might be what I was referring to. I want to take a moment to pay tribute to your amazing parents, whom I adore, Larry and Marnie Pakin, whose contributions to Canadian society have been legendary. They were instrumental in establishing the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra and Hamilton Place, now the first Ontario Concert Hall. And your dear mom has held senior board member positions at the McMaster University Medical Center, the Royal Ontario Museum, and the University of Toronto, just to name a few. I think it would be a gross understatement to say that you had a very well-rounded and intellectually stimulating childhood, don't you think? I think I won the lottery the day I was born. I would put it that way. I grew up in a blessedly normal household in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada in the 1960s with two wonderful parents. Now, for whatever reason, they decided to have another kid and my brother came along and he almost ruined everything. But for the most part, I have to say, I admire all of their choices. And, and yes, I, you know, to the extent I've had any success at all, I think it's because I got off to a pretty good start. Just you know, being blessed to live under Marnie and Larry Pakin's roof. I agree 110% with you. Now, Steve, you've spent your whole life being the one who asks the questions. And I invited you on our show to give your fans a chance to find out who you really are. You haven't given a lot of interviews in your career. Does it feel a bit strange to be on the other side of the table, so to speak? Yes, and I don't like it at all. And I'm, uh, <laughs> I must confess, I'm a little bit curious as to what you're going to ask. But um, yeah, I think one of the reasons, Harvey, that I got into the line of work that I'm into is that I'm immensely curious about how the world works. I am far more curious about what's going on out there than I am about what's going on in here or in here. Just doesn't interest me that much, frankly. So, okay, let's see how this goes. All right, here we go. Steve, after getting your undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, you got a master's degree in broadcast journalism from Boston University. What inspired your interest in journalism? I think it happened, actually. Well, it starts with what I just said, with the, with the sort of innate curiosity about how the world works. And then I think I discovered at the University of Toronto, in my very first week there, having no clue about what I wanted to do for a living, I think that's when I figured out that actually, if you're a very curious person and you want to find stuff out and tell people about it, that journalism is a good way to make a living. And it happened in my first week of U of T when I went to, I guess I, I should explain this a little bit for people who don't know the, the downtown campus of the U of T. They've got this great old Gothic building called Hart House, which is a place where, yeah, it's a student hangout and they've got an athletic center there. And in the first week of orientation, so classes hadn't even started yet, I went to Hart House to what was 
something basically called clubs night and you walk in and you know there's the chess club and the debate club and the archery club and the photography club and there was another table for something called u of t radio and a light went on i mean I, I, you know it was that eureka moment when i just thought oh wow this sounds really interesting and i went up to the guy behind the table and i said to him i was a big sports fan of course still am I said, do you have anybody who does the play-by-play -play for the varsity blues hockey or football games? And he said, nope. And I said, could I do it? And he said, yep. And I said, you mean I could be the Foster Hewitt of the University of Toronto? A reference to the guy who was the original play-by-play -play voice of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And he said, yep. And Harvey, that's all it took. It was a minute long conversation and it put me on the path for what I've been doing for the next 40 years. Amazing. How did you end up at TV Ontario? I actually started at CHFI and CFTR working for Ted Rogers. I was a city hall reporter. That was my first job in 1982. I spent a few years there. And then I got a call from someone who worked at CBC who said, we have an opening for a, a very short term contract here. It might've been four months long. And why don't you go for it? And I thought to myself, you know, I'm, I'm 24 years old. I've got a nice full-time city hall gig that's paying me, I think, $18,000 a year. Should I really leave that to go for a four month contract that might be over before you know it? And I thought, yeah, I'll give it a try. And that's how I ended up at CBC, spent seven years there, did a whole bunch of different things. And the guy who hired me at CBC had left, gone to TVO, suggested I come with him to TVO, and eventually I did. That's how I ended up at TVO in 1992, start of that year. There's a real message in that, that you took a risk, but you had enough faith in yourself. Somewhere inside you, you must have believed that if I take this short-term gig, they're going to see how good I am and they might keep me. Well, I think, you know, I'm not sure I had that much confidence. I think it was simply a case of I'm 24. You know, if it doesn't work out, I'll figure something out. But it worked out. For 12 years, you were a co-host on Studio Two, first with Mary Hines and then Paula Todd. And since 2006, you've hosted a show on your own. In the broadcasting world, is that seen as a promotion when you go from co-hosting to having your own show? Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't think about or worry about those things. I, I did Studio 2 and loved it for 12 years at TVO. Uh, it was actually two and a half hosts because Alan Gregg was contributing uh, items uh, a couple of days a week as well. So we were sort of two and a half hosts. And what I do remember about the transition was going from two and a half hosts to, uh, over the course of an hour to sole host for the full hour was an uptick in workload and responsibility like you could not imagine. I mean, for, for the first three years of doing that show, the show I'm doing now, I, like, I felt like I was treading water the whole time. It was, uh, it was really, really difficult to keep up with the, with the uptick in workload. But, you know, you keep at it. You put your head down. You hopefully figure it out. You know, you find a few shortcuts, you figure out how to do the job. And I think we're about to start our, geez, I can't remember. We started in 2006. So do the math. I guess we're 16th season coming up on now. It's amazing. And you seem as fresh as you did then. And when you started uh, hosting on your own, you did not make it look like there was a significant challenge. Well, what's the expression, Harvey? Fake it till you make it? I guess I was doing that because it certainly was. It was hard the first few years, really, really uh, challenging, but good challenging, like not challenging that I want to get on the floor in the fetal position and hide, challenging as in, I really want to see if I can do this. You know, I, I, I don't say this with any false modesty. I'm, I, I still love the job and I still want to do the job because I think I'm still trying to figure out the job. It's changed. The job I'm doing today is nothing like the job I did 16 years ago when the show started. So I'm still trying to figure out how to do it better. And I'm really hoping one of these days, I'm going to nail it. And again, no false modesty. I really want to get better at this still. Amazing, because I can't imagine you not seeing how good you are. But I think that's part of your charm. Now, well, the agenda... Harvey, can I share a line that my father told me many, many years ago? Yes. He said to me, son, be modest in all things. And fortunately for you, you have a lot to be modest about. And I've always remembered that. And I think it's great. They're great words to live by. I really think so. That's really true. Now, the agenda really solidified your reputation as a TV host we can trust to get people who know what they're talking about. And you ask the difficult questions. 
You educate us about social, political, cultural, economic issues. You've described the show as long form journalism because you conduct in depth interviews that are more than just the two minute sound bites that we see on every other network. I want to applaud you, Steve, for recognizing that there is an audience out there that has an attention span. Well, let me share the credit with a lot of people on that. I mean, I agree that that the show's big calling card is the fact that we don't have to sum everything up in five and six and seven minute interviews, that we can go on for a half an hour or we can do debates that are an hour long. I mean, that's the key. I'm often amused when I watch, you know, some of the 24 seven all news channels and you get five, six minutes into an interview and the host says, well, I wish we had more time, but we've got to move on. And I think to myself, what do you mean you wish you had more time? You're on 24 seven. You've got all the time you choose to do things in short bites because you think that's all the audience can handle. And one of the reasons I love working at TVO is that the culture of the place is such that we think people can handle a lot more. And the fact that we're still on 16 years later and the fact that we have the audience that we do suggests, no, that there are not billions of people out there who like our format, but there's enough to, to keep it going and support it. So we're going to offer it. It's, it's, I hope it's you know, the question I ask myself every day is, is, are we distinctive enough to warrant support from the public for what we do? And so far, most days of the week, I can answer yes. I, I really believe that. Oh, so do I. You do five one-hour shows a week, and you usually cover two topics per show. How big a staff have you got to help you with research and to prepare the questions? Well, I like to say we're lean and mean, uh, because it's a very small staff. Look, TVO is a, is a, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it is a small regional broadcaster. I mean, the budget for the whole TVO operation is much smaller than simply CBC National News. I mean, there's, you know, there's just no comparison. So we've got a small team, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 on the editorial side. And, you know, we're just constantly churning it out. That's, that's our job. One of the things that just amazes me so much about your talent as a talk show host and I can say this having appeared on your show twice, mm -hmm. is that when you have a panel of guests, you manage to make sure that every person on that panel gets an equal amount of time to say their piece. Steve, I know that's not easy, but you make it look so easy. It's a real skill. Well, thank you for saying so, but I, I should say that works both ways. For those who are a little shyer and need help getting in, I make sure they get their airtime. And for those who are air hogs and insist on too much airtime, I try to make sure that they don't hog the whole show. So uh, I, I take your compliment, but I, I think one of the things that I owe people who take the time out of their lives to come on the program is to make sure that it's a reasonably positive experience. And somebody who, somebody who insists on sort of filibustering the whole time, you know, they're going to have a little bit of a problem with me. And because I want to hear the voices that are not quite as cocky as, as those. And you do it very gracefully. I mean, I think it takes an astute viewer to recognize when you are jumping in to even out the playing field. I really think, I mean, I don't know what you learn in journalism school, but I think that's a gift that you just have. I don't know. I just sort of, you know, follow my nose on this kind of thing sometimes. And, and, you know, let's be frank about this. I don't know what your situation is right now, whether you have a, talk, a producer talking in your ear, but I do have the advantage of a, you don't, you're, you're, you're on your own out there. Eh? Okay. I do have the advantage of somebody talking in my ear and from time, because, you know, as you will know, the experience of talking to somebody in a studio and then the experience of actually watching it on television are two completely different things. And I may see things in the studio that the producer in a control room doesn't, uh, and conversely, they will see things in a control room that I will not feel being out on the set doing the thing in real time. So for producers in my ear saying, you know what, this guy's filibustering, cut him off. It's enough already. You know, he's really killing the clock. That can help me as well. Well, maybe that's the secret, but you make it look great. I'm very grateful that I usually have only one guest at a time because when I've had three and four, I've had to try to channel Steve Pakin and make sure they all get even time. <laughs> Now, I know you've had thousands of guests over the years, and I'm just wondering if there are any who stand out in your memory as being particularly special or extraordinary. Well, we did a show on the justice system once in which we had a judge named Harvey Brownstone on, and he was very, very good. I mean, made his points well, did not rag the puck, great personality, great chemistry with all the other guests, uh, really knew his brief. I'd have to put him, you know, if not at the very top of the list, very high up the list, Judge Brownstone.
That's very sweet of you. But really, <laughs> really, I mean, you've had uh, people that don't normally come on television. And you speak about the justice system. You had Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I, you know, the funny thing is, I remember going to Ottawa to a conference because part of getting people who are either nervous about television or don't want to do television, you know, think it's inappropriate for their position, for example, I have to do a lot of let's just call it handholding. And I do remember going to a conference in Ottawa once, not even so much to cover it, but just because I knew the Chief Justice was going to be there making a presentation. And I wanted to be able to go up to her afterwards and say, this is who I am. This is the program that we do. It's a serious program. We don't force you to speak in 20 second clips. You've had an absolutely, utterly fascinating life. Your job is massively important. And I would love it if you'd come on our program and talk to us about what you do. And I don't think any Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada had ever done television interviews before uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin did one on our program. So that was very good. The show you were on, we had uh, three or four judges on that program. And I think we did a number of programs where we had judges on who had never done television programs before. And, and, part, and I remember, uh, you know, Secretary to Cabinet, for example, for the Ontario government was another. We've had a few secretaries to Cabinet on, and they are notorious for not wanting to go on television, right? The politicians are supposed to take the spotlight. They're supposed to stay in the background. But I hope that I've been able to convince them that because it's a serious program, we're not out to play gotcha. We really want to understand more about the jobs that you do. I've been able to convince them to come on. And I, I think in every occasion, I can't think of a single time when somebody regretted coming on under those circumstances. Have there been guests who've surprised you? I suppose to a certain extent, every guest surprises me a little bit. You know, there are some things that get said that you, that you don't anticipate. As much as I think I know the guests and I have read my briefs before doing the program, usually there's a little something that's surprising. I don't know. I hope this won't take too long, but I'll tell you a little story about Kathleen Wynne when she came on the program once. The first time she came on, she was Minister of Education, had just been appointed Minister of Education uh, in the government of Ontario. So I guess this is something like, she got elected in 2003, so I'm guessing this is, uh, I don't know, a year or two later. And we sat around as a staff at TVO and thought, you know, she's openly gay, but she's not super openly gay. So do we ask her about this? And I remember thinking, do I go up to her before the interview starts and say, we'd like to ask you about this, but if she doesn't want to talk about it, then I've really kind of poisoned the well for the interview to come. I would certainly not spring it on her without sort of having her know that it was coming. So ultimately we decided, no, we're going to stick strictly to education and we're not going to ask about that issue at all. Even though she was the first openly gay education minister in Ontario history, but I wasn't sure that she was, you know, she hadn't talked a lot about it at that point, or maybe much at all in public about it. Fast forward several years, we're doing another program, and she's, she's not premier yet. She's in another cabinet portfolio. And she comes on the program, and somehow we, and it's about a gay-related issue. I think bullying of gay people, which you've, I have to say, spoken so eloquently about on this show. You've done, I'm sure, a lot of good for a lot of people who've dealt with this issue. You've been enormously helpful. Anyway, this is the subject for that show. She comes on the program. We get into the discussion. There are other people at the table as well. Somehow the issue comes up that gets related to the interview that we did years earlier when she was education minister. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to go here. And I said to her, Minister Wynn, I'm putting my question sheet aside because something just popped into my head and I want to ask you about it. And I went through the whole story about how when she first came on, we didn't know whether to raise it or not to raise it. I say, with the benefit of hindsight now, what should we have done? And she said, you should have raised it. You should have just raised it. And I would have been happy to talk about it, even though I hadn't talked much about it then. But it's important for gay people to see people like me, Kathleen Wynne, as role models, doing good work and, and being in public. And OK, none of that was scripted. I, I didn't know any of that was coming. We had no idea where we were going to go there before the interview started. And it was a big surprise. And it was a real authentic moment which I think to anybody who watched it would have been useful. So when you ask me, are there any surprises? I think that's the biggest one that I can recall off the top of my head. I'm so happy to hear you say that, Steve, because I watch your show religiously and I remember that show 
I remember being so proud of her for telling you, oh, you should have. I would have been happy to talk about it. And I hope you appreciate how reinforcing and validating that is for other gay people who are so afraid to come out to, to hear a government official being very comfortable with it. Well, I, I felt I needed to be a bit careful about it. And the reason was, I do remember after she was sworn in as premier, one of the first news conferences uh, Premier Wynne gave was to say, look, I'm not a crusader on gay rights issues. I am a gay person. I am openly gay. I'm leading as truthful a life as I can. But, but you know, I didn't get into public life to champion that issue and that issue alone. I have a lot of things that I'm interested in. And yes, that's one of them. So I, you know, that sort of reinforced for me the notion that that every time she's doing interviews on TV programs, this is not something she necessarily needs to or wants to talk about. She's interested in a lot of different things. And I wanted to kind of pay her that respect by not overindulging on the issue that, you know, maybe didn't need discussing at that particular moment. That's all. But I'm glad it was memorable for you. And I, I hope there are others who, who got to see it and who remember that because it was really a very authentic moment. You know, so much of television is canned, right? Like so much of it is I mean, obviously, we don't rehearse our programs, but so much of it is predictable. And you can sort of you can predict the questions, you can predict the answers. None of that was predictable. And I think that's why it had such an impact. Yes, it really did. Now, over the years, you've experimented with different formats. In 2008, you did the show in front of live audiences from communities throughout Ontario. Yeah. And then again, in 2010, you went on the road again, asking people across Ontario to contribute ideas on the most important issues facing them. You looked to me like you really enjoyed that interaction with the audience. Would you ever consider going on the road again? Oh, I, I'd love to do it as, I, as much as possible. I love to do it. I mean, you have to remember, we are TVO. The O stands for Ontario. It's not TVT, right? We, we love to get out of Toronto. The fact that we don't do it as much now is strictly a financial decision. I mean, TVO, when I started working there, was a company of 600 people. I think we're down around 200, 250 now, something like that. I'm not complaining about it. That's the reality. But the fact is, when you have less money, you have to make harder choices about what you can do. So while today we don't take the agenda on the road as much as we did, and I think we went to 33 different communities around Ontario when we did it, it was just great. We got all over the place met all sorts of people and just talked about all kinds of issues. It was really wonderful. While we don't take the show on the road as much now, we do have something uh, that does get our footprint out there, which is to say we have these things called Ontario hubs. They're like bureaus in different regions of the province. So we do have, for lack of a better expression, one man bands in different parts of Ontario. These folks, they, they do hits on TV for us. They write articles for our website for us. They keep an ear to the ground in the different regions of Ontario. And, and, and that's, you know, I think been really, really helpful in order to make sure that we really are TVO and not TVT. But your chemistry and comfort level in front of an, of an audience was quite a revelation to me. I'd never seen you in that context before, and I thought you were a real natural. I, I do hope you get the budget to do it again. Harvey, you and I have at least one thing in common, and that is we love people. We're curious about people. We want to know what makes people tick. We like meeting new people. We want to hear about their experiences. We want to know about their challenges. We want to know how they overcome them. You know, that's, that's the stuff that just flows through my veins all the time. I want to, I just, I love people. Yeah, that's why I love getting out on the road and, and having a chance to, to hear about the different, I mean, do I need to say it? People, people who live in Timmins have a different reality than those who live in downtown Toronto. You know, people who live in Windsor have a completely different life than those, you know, who live in Niagara Falls. You know, where you live, where you plant your flag has a hugely impactful change on how you live your life. So that's why I love getting out of the city so much. You know, Steve, when I tell people that I know you, I inevitably get two questions. So here goes. Question number one. Why haven't you gone to a bigger network in Canada? I think the answer to that is, why would I? I have everything I want and need where I am. I'm hosting a program that's reasonably well-respected, uh, where I have a decent-sized say in what happens, where there is absolutely like that much bureaucracy between an idea in my head and it ends up on the air. I like the people I work with. I like the mission of the place. We have a non-commercial mission. You know, we're, we're a program that, that 
treats people as citizens, not as eyeballs to be delivered to advertisers. I have no issue with that. You know, private television's wonderful. It's a different mission. You know, we're, we're in, it's not the same mission as I have. So I figured out a long time ago that the grass isn't greener. It's plenty green where I am. So I, I just, I, I really like everything about working there. You probably answered question number two, which was, why hasn't Steve gone to the United States? He could have become world famous and made a gazillion dollars. Well, I highly doubt that. But, but I mean, let me put it this way. I did go to Boston University for a year because, uh, well, number one, I love the Boston Red Sox, but that's another story. But number two, it was, it was an opportunity to live somewhere outside of Southern Ontario for once in my life because I just kind of knew, even in my early 20s, that the issues I cared about and the people I cared about and the stories I wanted to cover were all Canadian. And, and you know, who knows if I would have done more or better or, or worse, or who knows? I mean, I just, I've never been preoccupied by that question. I, I show up for work every day trying to learn something new, and I'm happy to be doing it in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'll tell you something your mother told me about five years after you started hosting the agenda uh, on your own. Someone had asked her, why doesn't Steve go to the States? I mean, it's a no brainer. He'd be a huge star there. He's so talented. They would snap him up in a minute. And your mom said, because my son cares about content, not selling toothpaste. <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good answer. I'm not yeah. saying that, 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 that there's, you know, obviously there are other stations besides TVO in Canada that care about content as opposed to, you know, selling toothpaste. But, but I think what she's getting at there is that content is king for me and the issues that I care the most about are happening in the province of Ontario. And therefore, I'm happy here. I don't want to leave. I think we're all, we all benefit from that decision of yours. And it's, it's actually very admirable because in this business, there's a lot of ambition and there's a lot of ego. And the fact that you never even wanted to try says something about your principles. And you really yeah. do know yourself very well. You know what you like. I, okay, but, and, and because uh, th this is sounding like if you go to the United States, you're somehow not a loyal Canadian. And I, I, I do not want to convey that impression. I think for a lot of people, you know, they want to try a lot of different things in the business. They don't only, I mean, it happens to be that my preference is to spend my time in my home province, studying the issues of my home province. But I don't begrudge anybody who wants to get out there and try it in the States or go somewhere else around the world. I got lots of friends, actually, I used to work with uh, in Toronto. I think of Kevin Tibbles at NBC or, I mean, Ona Fletcher I used to work with. She went to Chicago or, you know, the list goes on. Anyway, Colleen McEdwards went to CNN. Uh, Jonathan Mann went to CNN. Everybody's got to follow their own path. That worked for them. This works for me. Now, Steve, no one knows better than you that the broadcasting industry has changed drastically since you started out over 30 years ago. The internet, streaming platforms, social media have revolutionized the way people get information and entertainment. Are you happy with the evolution you've seen in the industry? Yes and no. I'm happy that I have a direct contact with my audience, for example, on Twitter or on Facebook, and they can get direct access to me. I mean, we talked about Kathleen Wynne earlier. This is a great example where she was opening the UP Express, this, this $600 million rapid transit system that goes from Union Station up to uh, Pearson Airport. And I remember, you know, when you talk about the power of, of Twitter, I remember being at the press conference at Pearson Airport when the thing got to its destination and the press conference is happening and I'm live tweeting it and people are tweeting me suggested questions for the premier. And in the middle of the press conference, I am their conduit, right? They're saying to me, ask her about this. So I did. Now, I love that aspect of it, you know, direct in real time access uh, to the decision makers for my audience. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is that there's way too much toxicity and grossness and incivility that I just can't stand. And, you know, I spend a whole lot less time right now on Twitter than I used to. I think I made a decision just about, I don't know, six months or a year ago that I, I, I'm just not going to be able to convert everybody on Twitter to civility, and I'm, and I'm not going to try anymore. And I just spend less time on it. I still use it to promote our work. I still use it if people have direct questions for me. I answer, you know, reasonable questions. But if people want to be idiots, I just, I got no time for that anymore. 
And um, so I, I would love it. I would love it if these platforms could realize their true potential for, for more collegiality and more learning and more interaction, as opposed to just be yet another part of the culture wars that we're just so ingrained in right now. But, you know, Harvey, that's, that's, that's a fight I'm not going to win. I, I wanted to win it, but I just, I know I'm not going to, and I'm just, I'm as a result, spending less time on it. Yeah, it's not worth your energy. Now, you've been a highly recognizable presence on television in Canada for 30 years. Are Canadians respectful of your fame? By that, I mean, can you live your private life, go about your business relatively free from interference by fans? Absolutely. And, and let's not exaggerate it. I mean, I'm again, I, I host a current affairs program on TVO. It's not, you know, I mean, everything's coast to coast nowadays by virtue of the fact it's on the Internet. So, I, boy, that lesson came home to me one time. This is probably 15 10, 15 years ago, somehow I got CC'd on a letter from a group in Sweden, which said, you got to watch this show called The Agenda. They have a show on childcare issues, and we're dealing with all the same issues here. So watch this show. And I thought, my goodness, somebody in Sweden is watching The Agenda. And then I think the folks upstairs sent me a map which had red dots on it for everywhere that there was an Agenda viewer. And of course, the, 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 there are red dots all over the world. The, the fact that we program to an Ontario audience doesn't mean if we're on YouTube that people all over the place aren't watching it, which I guess they are. So, and this is Canada, Harvey, this is Canada. I mean, people are very respectful. I know there are times I'm sitting there on the subway and, you know, I'll go on Twitter later in the day and somebody will put a picture of me from sitting on the subway on Twitter saying, there's Steve Pakin from the agenda. I wanted to go up and say hi to him, but I didn't want to bother him. He was reading his notes and I didn't want to disturb him. And invariably, I will chime back in on Twitter under those circumstances and say, come up and say hi next time. You know, Canadians, for the most part, are just unfailingly in person, civil, in a way that they may not be anonymously on Twitter, if you get my drift. I sure do. What was it like to host the show from home during COVID? I guess I give two answers to that. One, I was glad we were able to do it. You know, not everybody was able to stay on the air during COVID because some places just got shut down. So I was thrilled that we were very quickly able to figure out a new platform and keep the agenda on the air throughout COVID-19. And when I say everybody working from home, I mean everybody. I was hosting the program from my attic. The executive producer was executive producing from her home. The director was directing from his home. The switcher was switching from his home. The guests were all coming from their homes. Nobody was in a control room anywhere. Now, as the pandemic got more under control, a few of us were allowed back into the station. I went into the station to host, the director and a few other people, audio technician, were able to join me. They in the control room, me on the set, a camera operator from 25 feet away, long way wearing masks, we could figure it out. But for much of the last, I don't know, 16 months or so, you know, it's been 12 hours a day in my attic. So A, happy we could stay on the air, but B, very happy to eventually get out of the attic. I prefer being in the studio. And as you can tell, I'm at my cottage now, I'm still in an attic, which is wonderful because I at least am still able to talk to you and be in touch with you, even though I'm a long way away from Toronto. Yeah, that is great. And I think it was really helpful to the viewers of your show that throughout the pandemic, you were still covering issues that were important. They were current. We weren't watching reruns. But I can imagine there were challenges because the technology isn't always that great. Oh, no, the technology frustrated us all the time. But again, we had to consider the alternatives. The alternative was not to be on the air. And to us, that was not an alternative. I mean, we're paid by the citizens of Ontario to do our jobs. And damn it all, we were going to do our jobs. And, you know, this was the most important public health story in 100 years. I could not imagine us doing everything we possibly could to stay on the air the frustrations of the technology notwithstanding. And yes, it was a problem from time to time and screens froze up and audio was lousy and you know all the stuff that everybody's dealing with when they go on Zoom. But the fact is we didn't miss a show. We stayed on the air, we did our jobs. That's what we're paid to do. So I was very happy about that. Steve, you gained enormous respect from Canadians of all political stripes when you took on the challenging role of moderating numerous federal and Ontario leadership debates. 
That was quite a stretch from what you were used to doing on TV and you made it look effortless. Did you enjoy the role of being a referee in those debates? I don't think enjoy is the right word. I was honored to have been asked to do it, but it's the most nerve wracking thing you will do as a broadcaster. Uh, mostly because, again, we get back to, let's be honest, 100,000 people might watch the agenda in a typical evening. Six million people might watch a leader's debate, sometimes nine million. If you screw that up, everybody's going to know it. So you want to make sure you don't screw it up. And I remember Mark Bulgutch, who was the executive producer of all the debates that I was fortunate enough to do, he said, you like hockey? Yes. Uh, who are the best referees? I said, I don't know. What are you getting at, Mark? He said, the ones whose names are not in the paper the next day. And I totally got it, right? Like, you're not the show. They're the show. Facilitate them having a good show. Provoke them to engage in debate so that people can make up their minds for election day. But you don't want your name in the paper the next day because you, you know, people thought you favored this person over that person, et cetera. So that's, it's a nerve wracking experience, but I'm happy to have had the chance to do it. Would you do it again? You know, sure. But I, I mean, it's not going to happen. I, however, I've done seven of them. I really hoped to be lucky enough to be able to do one in the course of my life. Uh, I've now done three federal and four provincial. I'm 61 years old. It's somebody else's turn. You know, let the next generation have their shot at it. It's really, it's, it, it, it really is a great honor to do it. And, and I'm happy to pass the torch to the next generation. Fair enough. Steve, you've written seven books, which are all shown on the screen behind me, and your show's website contains dozens of articles you've written, and you've produced five documentaries. How do you find the time to do everything you do? I got some great advice from my wife many, many years ago who said, you know, there are these hours between midnight and 6 a.m., which you're really not using to your best benefit. You know, if you would work then, uh, you could really get a lot more done. I'm sort of teasing a little bit. No, what can I tell you? I love what I do. I, I, I love what I do. And I realize I'm not here for very long. And I'm trying to have as much impact as I can in the short space of time that I'm here. And I don't pretend for a second that any of this is going to last beyond when I leave. But it helps add to what I hope is a meaningful life. And there are stories that I like to tell on television, which I'm trying to tell. There are stories that I can tell in 900 words in a website article, which I try to tell. And there are stories uh, that I think need three, four, 500 pages to tell. So I try to tell those. And I just enjoy the hell out of it. I mean, I'm up here at my cottage right now writing my eighth book. This one's about former Prime Minister John Turner, who died last September, and who had, I think, one of the most remarkable lives of any Canadian politician. I mean, most politicians, Harvey, have a, th their life happens in three acts. You know, there's the lead up to politics, there's their political careers, and there's their post-political careers. And John Turner just had a remarkably Shakespearean story, which I think probably had five or six acts, you know, because he was there, he was the rising star, he was our John Kennedy, then he left for a while, went to Bay Street, made his fortune, came back in, became prime minister for a while, leader of the opposition, left politics, had a whole post-political career as you know, one of Canada's great champions of democracy. I'm concerned that, you know, if you're under 50 years old, you don't know who John Turner is. And I want to make sure future generations know who he is. So that's why I'm working on this book now. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that book. In many of your books, especially The Life and The Dark Side, you explore the often bitter realities of political life. Did you ever consider running for public office? No, never once. And, and not because I don't think it's an important job. I do. And not because there are no uh, redeeming qualities about the job. Of course, there are. The life, the subtitle of the life is the seductive call of politics. You know, there's never any shortage of people who want to get into this game because it is really a very important and can be a very worthwhile way uh, to spend your time on earth. Um, but the second book was called The Dark Side, The Personal Price of a Political Life, because I wanted people to know that, uh, yes, you know, there's no life like it, as that old expression from the army says. But on the other hand, uh, the price you can pay for going into it can be extremely high. So go in with your eyes open. And I've never, I've never been attracted to it because I just think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. 
Uh, I just don't think I'm supposed to be doing that. I think I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing. One of the documentaries you produced entitled Return to the Warsaw Ghetto is about three survivors and their families who returned to Warsaw to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It's an incredibly powerful film. I remember seeing it when it first aired on TV in 1993. You won, I think it was three awards at film festivals in Canada, the United States, China. I think it's the most important film you've made so far, and I hope there's a way it can be made more widely available. That's very kind of you to say. I, I certainly, I did like that documentary. I put a lot, I put a lot of my heart and soul into that documentary. It was a, it was a story that was important, I thought, to tell. Half of my family is from Poland originally. Uh, our family was touched by the Holocaust. Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted you got a chance to see it. It's a, it's a strange thing. I mean, the, I guess the documentary is there. And I guess, you know what? I think it still gets played in the middle of the night sometimes because for whatever reason, I do get people coming up to me even now. And you pointed out the documentary is almost 30 years old. There are people who both come up to me and who come up to the people who I chronicle in the documentary. <laughs> and they say, you guys must have played it again because I got people calling me again saying they see it. So I guess it's out there every now and then. But yes, I, I, I thought that was worth doing. And I'm glad I did it. You served as Chancellor of Laurentian University from 2013 mm -hmm. to 2021. When you accepted the position, you said that you wanted to do whatever you could to support the university's mission to make the world healthier, more sustainable and inclusive. You were there eight years. Does the position of Chancellor really allow you to get involved in university affairs in a deep way? Uh, very interesting question, because I, when they asked me to do it, I said, oh, no, you've got the wrong guy. I know what chancellors do. They lobby governments. They raise money. I can't do any of that stuff. I'm in journalism. I'm not allowed to do that stuff. They said to me, no, we got people to do that. We need you to be kind of a champion for Laurentian, to engage with the students, to preside over convocation, to, to help us during the course of the year to raise our profile, that kind of thing. I mean, Laurentian's a very big deal in Northern Ontario but I'm not sure many people south of the French River had heard of it. It's the biggest university in Northern Ontario, almost 10,000 students. And for, you know, for almost all of the eight years that I was chancellor, I really loved it. It was really a great uh, experience. And Harvey, the thing I used to do, I mean, I've been to enough convocations at other universities to know that what usually happens is the chancellor gets up there and gives a speech, which he or she has written, and it's the same speech for every convocation. And, you know, <laughs> U of T, gosh, I don't know. Do they do 30 convocations? Maybe. I, I know at Laurentian, we did, I think, about 13, you know, to get through all of the students. The thing I thought I would do that could make my chancellorship different was to give a different speech at every convocation, which I did. And I gave that speech not by preparing any remarks ahead of time. The students would come up, because Laurentian was small enough, the students would come up to the stage, I would hand them their degree, the president and I would have, uh, you know, 30 seconds of conversation with them, I would ask questions, and very often I would get either funny answers, or heartfelt answers, or surprising answers, or, you know, just touching answers, and as that person walked off stage, and the next person came on stage, I would turn around and just jot down a couple of words on a piece of paper to trigger my memory of it. So that by the time all the 150 students or so had gone through it, I then went up to the podium and I gave my speech and it was just sort of riffing on some of the stuff that I'd heard up on the stage. And I think that was the right thing to do because I had lots of people come up to me after the speeches and then after I stopped being chancellor saying, you know, your speech, good. I, I wanted them to be more memorable than just sort of the standard boilerplate speech of you got a good education here and we hope you'll stay in touch and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So yeah. I enjoyed all aspects of that. Now, obviously, Harvey, a bomb's hit Laurentian right now. And when that happened, I had to resign my chancellorship because, uh, well, because I'm in journalism. And, you know, it worked as long as things were not controversial. But as soon as things got controversial and Laurentian became a story, I really couldn't be affiliated with it anymore. And they're going through some incredible challenges right now. And obviously, I wish them all well, and I hope they can get out of them and and continue to be the important anchor for education in Northern Ontario that they've been for 60 years. I hope so. You know, you speak about your commencement speeches. I think it's important to note 
you hold honorary doctorates from McMaster, Victoria, Laurentian, York University. You've been granted honorary diplomas from Humber, Centennial, Mohawk, Fanshawe College. That's a lot of commencement speeches you've had to come up with over the years, Steve. Congratulations. Boy, what those colleges and universities will do to get a free speaker, eh? <laughs> When it's I don't. I mean, it's lovely. I mean, let's be honest. The experience is lovely. It's a wonderful thing. But again, remembering my father's admonition, I don't inhale. Yeah, that's what keeps you humble. And your dad is a very humble man. When aspiring students come up to you for advice about how to break into the broadcasting industry, what do you tell them? I tell them first and foremost, read everything you can get your hands on. Uh, mostly because I did. I mean, I used to walk around when I was a 20 something with a plastic, you know, shopping bag filled with newspapers all the time. Obviously, there was no internet when I started in this business. So that's what I did. And any spare moment I had on a subway, on a bus, walking down the street sometimes, in between innings at a baseball game, I'd pull the newspaper out and I'd just read. I wanted to get educated. I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more. I knew that if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to get good at this job, I had to know stuff. And what I didn't know, I could ask questions about. But you got you to kind of have a basic foundation of knowledge about stuff in order to be able to ask the right questions. So that's the first thing I say. Read everything. All political spectrums, you know, all places on the political spectrum. The other thing I always say is start writing. And it doesn't matter if nobody's reading it. Get into the practice of of seeing something, being interested in something, and write something about it. Create your own blog just for practice. I know when I went into the Hamilton Spectator for my, to get a part-time job in 1979, one of the things that I was able to show them was scrapbooks filled with newspaper articles that I had written for the University of Toronto newspaper. And they weren't very good, let's be honest, but at least, you know, it, I, I could demonstrate to them that I had tried. You know, I wasn't just right in off the street. I tried. So I'd say those two things. And a third thing is, for God's sakes, be curious about the world. I really don't like it when, when people go into broadcast journalism because they want to be famous. You know, they like being on TV. I mean, it's fine to like being on TV, but if that's why you're doing it, you're missing the whole point. The point is to be curious about the world, figure out how it works and try to explain that to people. So those are the three things I would mention. That's very good advice. Steve, I'm incredibly proud to say that in 2013, you were made an officer of the Order of Canada and you were invested into the Order of Ontario. Did you ever imagine that your career would bring you such recognition and respect? 2013 was a great year. Laurentian Chancellorship, Order of Canada, Order of Ontario, Red Sox win the World Series, and my son Zach and I actually went to one of the games. That was the best part of the whole year, actually. <laughs> The memories of father and son going to first an American League Championship Series game in Boston and then going to a World Series game uh, in St. Louis. And they won both games. You know, Harvey, sports is ridiculous, right? It's not all that important at the end of the day, but it presents opportunities for people to be in each other's company and enjoy themselves. And I love the fact that I don't think my son, my oldest son, Zach, who went to that American League Championship Series game at Fenway Park in Boston with me when David Ortiz hit a grand slam home run in the bottom of the eighth inning to bring the Sox back down from 5-1 to tie it 5-all. I don't think he's ever hugged me harder in his life. And those are the moments worth living for. And then in the bottom of the ninth, I still remember this, Jared Saltalamacchia had a, a single over the left side and the Sox won the game. They walked off with the victory and we stayed up all night long partying in Boston, father and son all night long, like we didn't go to bed and then went to the airport at 5 a.m. to fly home. Like that's why I love sports. I mean, yes, I'm into the stats and all that stuff, but, but that's why I love sports. It's wonderful opportunities to bond with, with parents, with kids. And so, yeah, the Order of Canada was nice and the Order of Ontario was nice. It's ridiculous, actually. I don't deserve them, but they wanted to give them to me, so okay. But 2013 will always be remembered in my life as the year that Zach Pay can hug me harder than he ever has in his whole life. You see, to me, that tells me that your heart and your priorities are in the right place. Hope so. That's what it tells me. So what's left for Steve Paikin? You've got the book about John Turner coming out. Are there more mountains to climb in your career? I, I guess so. You know, I'm not one of those people who has ever had a five-year plan or, you know, here's what I want to be doing at this point in my career down the road. 
I guess I like to use the metaphor of a canoe. I just sort of get in the canoe and I just start paddling and, you know, I don't have a map. Let's see where the canoe takes me. Let's see where the, the stream takes me. So I guess the short answer is I hope so, but I'm not sure what it will be. I mean, none of what's happened in my professional life. I don't know, Harvey, did you always want to be a judge? Did you know someday you'd always be a judge? I wanted to from the day I went to court the first time. Yes. There you go. So you knew. I didn't really know. You know, I, you know if, if anybody had said to me, these things will happen to you over the course of your life, you know, I would just sort of say, boy, I can't imagine that, but okay, let's see. So that's where, that's where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm just happy to stay in the canoe and see where it goes. But you're steering it. I'm steering it, but I am, I am uh, influenced by the current. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I like that. You're open to wherever the current might take you, but you're in charge. In charge. I mean, is anybody really ever in charge of anything? Well, you make I, choices. I, I, you make choices. You make choices. For example, do you yeah. think you'll ever choose to retire from television? Here's how I answer that question. I look around and the people I have admired most who, do, who used to do what I do, there was a day of reckoning for all of them, right? One day they knock on your office door and they say, you know what, this has been great, but um, time's up. And that day is waiting for all of us, as it is for me, of course it is. And, you know, I'm obviously at a stage in my career now where I know I'm <clears throat> going to have fewer tomorrows than I had yesterday's. And maybe that's one reason why I'm trying to squeeze every drop out of the lemon, because I know that at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what? I, I tried my best. I did as much as I could. I, 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 you know, nobody gets to do it all, but I did it. I did a lot and no regrets. So when the knock on the door comes, I will stick out my hand. I guess we're not allowed to shake hands anymore with COVID. So I'll give them a little fist bump and I'll say, thanks. I've loved every minute of it. And I'll go figure out something else. Well, Steve, I have to tell you, I have loved every minute of this interview. It's been a huge honor to have you on our show I followed your career with great interest and enormous pride from the very beginning. You deserve a lot of credit for remaining true to your principles. You're true to yourself. You've retained your integrity, your commitment to excellence and everything you do. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to come on our show, Steve. You are a dear soul, Harvey. It's been a real honor and pleasure for me to have known you as long as I have. And uh, you are clearly the most successful babysitter I've ever had in my life. So well done to you too. And you see, it wasn't all that scary to be interviewed. It wasn't all that comfortable either, but it's okay. We both got through it. Thank you again, Steve. Our guest has been the incomparable TV host and national treasure, Steve Pakin. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.